Thank you very much, Stuart, for those uh, kind words by in of introduction, and, and, and thank you very much for, for the invitation to, to come and address the, the OR Society at uh, the annual conference. Uh, and it's, it's, always, it's always special to be on the, the campus at Loughborough. Being involved in sport, I, I get down here a few times, uh, and it's always special. I do like to see... I'm one of those Scots who do actually like cricket, even though it's not a, a sport that we, we excel in with any great. I must admit, it is one of the sports, even as a Scotsman, I support England in. But when I was growing up, uh, when it came to, came to cricket, I always supported the underdog. And when it came to cricket, England were the underdog. So. Uh, and they've tried hard in the last series to, to make themselves underdogs at times, but then occasionally they have actually played really, really well. So, um, as Stuart said, I've... Uh, uh, well... I, should, I, I work in, and when I analyse things, I tend to analyse in terms of four quarters. So I've kind of organised my agenda. So I'll say a little bit by way of introduction uh, as to what I'm about. But what I wanted to try and talk about is, is my, my take on, on this word, analytics, that if you search back, about 20 odd years ago, there wasn't much in the way of use of this word, and now everyone seems to use it. It's a bit, it's a bit like that, that phrase, evidence-based. It now seems to get added to everything. So uh, analytics, I'll, I'll give you my take, and then look at some of the ways that analytics have developed in elite sports, some of my involvements, some of the inspirations I've taken, particularly talking about uh, Moneyball, and uh, how much of a game changer it has been in sports analytics. And hopefully, if time's, uh, time's not against us, to give you a sense of where I think the leading edge is now in the application of analytics in sport. And it really is very much on the spatial, dealing with uh, the analysis of data and space. And I, I just want to talk through some of, the, some of the ways that we're moving forward in that. Um, I'm, in many ways, just an old-fashioned Scottish empiricist. I've got ideas about why things happen in the world, and I use data to try and interrogate those ideas and develop my understanding. It'll be no surprise to you that one of my favourite genres, both in terms of reading and uh, in terms of TV viewing, is, is the whodunits. Uh, and for me, analytics is, it's forensic. It's like CSI, but we don't have the dead bodies. Um, so uh, it's, that's my mindset. Uh, I've got an ability, I think, to, to try and to see patterns in numbers, but to see patterns that, are, that we can action. Uh, and that's what I, I, I want to talk about. I, I feel as though I've got a kind of Indiana Jones existence part prof, part practitioner, you know, the day job is being in this kind of setting and I enjoy it. As I say, I'm a proud Scot and education's always been a very, very important part of, of the culture that I've been brought up with and it's why I, I, I made the decision to move out of industry and base my, most of my career within academia. I love to teach, I love to coach. I just love working with people and trying to help people bring the best out of themselves. That's my day job. The night job is working with a particular type of decision maker, the coaches, and helping them understand what, it needs to, what they need to do to put themselves in the best position of winning. So the coaches I get on best with are the coaches who are natural statisticians, who are trying to control what they can control and give themselves the best chance of winning and understand that they're not always going to win. They, it's about putting themselves, in, in other words, about giving themselves the greatest likelihood of being successful. And I'm going to talk about a particular coach who's been very, very important in, in the development of the evidence-based uh, approach to coaching that I've worked in and, and, and have used statistical analysis, data analysis in. So that's my night job. That kind of takes over my life from about four in the afternoon till. So 
Unfortunately, Stuart, I will be watching sport tonight because my first love are playing uh, Paris Saint-Germain tonight. So uh, I'll, be, uh, I'll be watching the hoops at some point. But I believe there might be a TV in the village. Hopefully showing the Celtic game. <laughs> Um, my career path, I, I went to my home university of Aberdeen and I, uh, my degree, all my degrees at Aberdeen, Cambridge and York have been in economics, but I did a lot, as I said, I'm an old-fashioned empiricist, Scottish empiricist. I, I was wise enough when I did my undergraduate degree to go and get taught statistics by statisticians in the stats department. I was taught by a very, very good medical statistician. Um, I also, uh, Aberdeen had a, an interesting final year option that I chose. It was a two, well, it was three terms in those days. Um, and I chose to do it, and it was, you know, the final option with numbers. And they did half of it was econometrics and half of it was OR. <laughs> and it, uh, it kind of captured who I am because the econometrics was all theory. And the OR was the practice got me into a bit of trouble. It, those were the days when you did eight finals papers and there were five questions. The paper, you had to do five questions. The paper was split into two sections. Section A was all the econometrics eight questions and section B was all the OR questions. And you had to do at least one from each. I thought, okay, 70 to get first. Five questions, each 20. Right, I'm gonna concentrate all my time on the OR make sure I've got pretty close to 80 on that. And if I have any time left, I'll have a go at the, the theory question of econometrics. I found out subsequently a guy who had just, his first job was a lecturer was given. He'd just arrived and he was made second marker on this paper. And he tried to argue very strongly, he admitted afterwards, that I shouldn't get a first. Because although I'd more or less got 80 out of 80 on the OR, I'd only left about five minutes for the econometrics, and I think he gave me five marks out of 20 for that one. So his argument, how can you give a first to someone who's only got five out of 20 on the econometrics? Uh, fortunately, he was defeated on that one. <laughs> I hadn't broken the rules. I was just very strategic. Um, I should have gone down OR. It was actually my sister. Was the, she was the first class mathematician uh, and her first, uh, her career, her, her first job after qualifying as a maths teacher, she, have we got anyone from the, what was then called the British Gas OR unit? That was my sister's first gig, uh, working, uh, working with you guys in the London office back in the 80s before she, she then went off and spent her life in, uh, spent her life in the oil industry implementing SAP systems. Uh, I, I did go into industry. I had a wonderful time at, at Unilever. I was called an economist. These days I would have been called a business analyst. And basically the way I worked at Unilever is how I work today with coaches. Uh, about understanding the problems and decisions they had to make. And then I would go off and try and do some relevant analysis with the available data and take it back to them and we'd have this discussion. And I worked on you know, such fascinating problems as why was the Unilever operating company in Belgium losing market share in the mayonnaise market? Uh, I'm giving away my age. How could we recover ma market share in the West German cup of soup market? Uh, I also did some strategic analysis on the, on the global detergents market. Um, as well as how come AIM toothpaste launches were more successful in Australia than in New Zealand. That's the kind of work I was doing at Unilever. Moved into academia, started as a lecturer in economics, made it all the way to uh, become a prof in business and sports analytics. I'm still a big kid at heart, I love sport. And about 20 years ago, I started to realise that I could take my passion for sport and combine that with my skills with numbers and, and get away into sport. I was one of those when it came to sport, particularly what we call in Scotland in the northeast, FITBA. Uh, I think if you come from across the water, you call it soccer. I hate that word with a passion, but I have to use it when I visit friends and uh, go to conferences in North America because they kind of call football a sport where it seems to be it's the, the least loved player is the only one who actually puts contact to the ball with his feet, but hey ho, they call it football. And I love that game. Uh, but I was brought up to Fitba, 
uh, you would know it as association football. The team that, uh, you know, the game that the Scots invented and brought around the world, including England. Uh, and I got, um, I was born sort of 99% 90, enthusiasm, 1% skill, and I played a reasonable amount of amateur football to my late 30s and played around the world and loved it. In the late uh, mid 90s, I started to take my uh, skill set, if you like, my professional skill set, and put it to work. I, uh, it started with a research paper uh, with a good friend of mine, Steve Dobson, who's a prof in the economics at, at Hull, a Leicester lad. And we, we were debating, you know, had the transfer market in in football gone crazy because Newcastle had paid 15 million for a foot. Oh no, he wasn't a football pundit then. He used to score goals, Alan Shearer. World record transfer fee, 15 million pounds. Had football gone crazy. So we, we started being both economists. We tried to put together, you know, we came from, well, there's a rhyme and reason for prices in a market. Transfer fees are a price. So we started, we developed a, uh, uh, Steve put together the data, I developed a, a, a basic model and we estimated it and got some papers published on the transfer market in football and people start to ask, so can you value players? That was my interest, the practice. So I got into player valuation and that was my starting point around about 96, 97, starting to, to value players. I developed a player valuation system. At that point, it was mainly financial institutions who were interested in the, and the boardroom to some extent, so value in squads and using squads as a, an asset base for borrowing. Got me more into the financial analysis and at that point I actually moved from economics uh, within the business school at Leeds, I actually moved into the accounting and finance department and started to develop a better understanding of analysis of performance, financial performance. And again, a lot of those skill sets that I developed then, I'm now using on performance data from the pitch, what players are actually do. And that, that was my main interest. And I, as I developed the player valuation system, I was quite fortunate because it was towards the end of the late, the end of the 90s, we started to see systems develop. Companies, commercial companies like Prozon and Opta started to uh, gather commercially the data of what players were doing on the pitch because up to then we didn't have the technology really to do it so all we really knew about what happened say on a football pitch was who played who scored and who was a bad boy and got a yellow card or a red card that's all because if you think about it that's all the league's authorities needed to know what was the score who played uh, and for disciplinary reasons, uh, you know, be able to, to determine yellow cards, red cards, and, and who had to be suspended. And you, didn't, you could do that with paper and pencil. There wasn't much in the way of analysis. And, the, and if you go back and look at sports science research uh, on football uh, in the, the 70s and 80s, uh, you find that, you know, the, the data sets are pretty small just because it would take anything up to 12 to 20 hours to take the video of a game and extract the data you wanted. Fortunately, with the development of uh, software systems, the development of tracking systems, by the late 90s, we started to get, at least commercially, uh, data on what players were actually doing on the pitch. So I was well placed at that point, given that I developed valuation systems to start doing what I really was interested in was actually analysing what was happening on the pitch. I started to develop player and team rating systems uh, and, and analysing that and that then led into being uh, starting to work with coaches. I started to move from uh, working with the decision makers in the boardroom to working with the decision makers in the dressing room that, with the coaches and started to develop evidence-based coaching. But what I found was that the people who were really interested in that and willing to embrace it was in rugby union, not football, certainly in the UK. And I, uh, I guess that where it really developed over a five year period was my involvement with Saracens, which I'll talk about uh, a little bit. And that's now led on to, to working with, with London Irish. So 
What's this thing called analytics? Is it just an old wine in a new bottle? Um, for me, analytics, the difference between analytics and the word analysis is that analytics is about purpose. It's purpose-led analysis. It's all about doing analysis that underpins decision-making. If it isn't feeding into real-world decision-making, to me, it isn't analytics. Um, I think the head of analytics in New York City described it as actionable insight. I think that's very, very succinct and hits, uh, hits the nail on the head. Uh, it's about producing insight from the data that's actually, it's not statistics, uh, and that's, it's, uh, in fact, uh, he was very, very critical of, of statistics in, in that sense and said, I don't go out and hire st statisticians, I hire people who can uh, get actionable insight out of data, who understand the data, understand the decisions. I call it the three Ds. It's first and foremost about decisions. To make good decisions and understand the, uh, to, to, sorry, to make a good input into that decision making process, you've got to understand the decision makers, you've got to understand, have an understanding of the domain in which they're operating in. And the data comes, if you like, third. Having understood the decisions to be made, the context in which those decisions are being, uh, being made, that the, the decision makers are working in, then what's the available data and how can that data be analysed to, uh, with an understanding of the context to feed in uh, to the decision making process. That's what analytics is. It is purpose led analysis. Uh, doesn't endear me to some of my colleagues when I say, you know, typically academics don't do analytics. We do a lot of data analysis, uh, but unless, and it, it links back to, you know, the, the opening address we had, if it's not impacting on decision making and impacting and being feeding into organisations and managers and decision, who are making decisions in the real world, then it isn't analytics. So that's my view on analytics. So how does it link in with, uh, with operations, operational research? In many respects, data analytics, data science is, is just a new designation of what we previously uh, might have called OR and, and would have seen in, in, encompassed within OR and management science. It, it's concerned about using analytical methods to support decision making. For me, it's practice led, not discipline led. That's the difference. Uh, coming from an economics background, the difference between what I do, data analytics and econometrics, is that the econometrics is discipline-led, but a lot of the tools that I have developed through uh, my uh, work in econometrics, when I apply those to try and impact on decision-making, that's, uh, that's data analytics. That's when I move from from econometrics, from statistics, into data analytics. Uh, the analytics uh, has, it's clear, has got much, has puts much greater emphasis if you look at, you know, uh, what's described by data analytics, data science, much more emphasis on statistical modeling than optimization. It's closely associated, I think, with the emergence of big data. I think there's an argument to say perhaps analytics is too closely associated with big data. I'm, what I work in is small data. I'm a small data analyst in the sense that I'm trying to understand what people are doing, players are doing, to help the coaches to feed back into the decision making that players are making in particular contexts, in particular situations in games. Uh, I don't have particular big data sets, not in terms of the you know, sizes of some of the data sets some of you probably work with. What data for a rugby union game, I'm probably working with about 1,500 rows of data for a single game. For a football game, I'm probably getting about 7,500 rows of data. So, yeah, uh, you know, the data set I was working on this summer for London Irish in terms of the tactical planning, I had about what, 600,000 rows of data and that not particularly big in terms of 
big data. But a lot of my work is I would call small, small data, really understanding the context, trying to understand the behavioral patterns, I, what the decision making, the players, and trying to, trying to get inside the DNA of opposition. If I can understand what makes the opposition tick and feed that back to the coaches, uh, who can then use it with the players, it'll put them in a much better position to, to be successful uh, in, the, in the game. So for me, uh, analytics, I summarise it in terms of that acronym TAR. Talk, analyse, recommend. You've got analytics first and foremost is about decision making and therefore it's got to start with talking with the decision makers. It's not like doing research where you've got the freedom to decide what you want to research on. No, that's been, that was the great, the great thing about academia. It was that, uh, the, the ability to, to choose what you want to research on and have that freedom. That's not the case if, you're work, if I'm working with the coaches at London Irish. They're focused on Friday night at the moment, playing sale. In, say, uh, in Manchester Friday night, the decisions that the players have to make in that game and trying to put together the tactics. So I need to talk with the decision uh, with the, the coaches and understand what the what the issues are, what they 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 want me to look at, and I'm fed them back some of my analysis from the first couple of games that Sale have played. So it starts talking with the decision makers to understand what they are trying to do, the decisions they have to make, analysing the data, and then talking again, feeding that back. So that, I call it the TAR model, talk, analyse, recommend. That to me summarises analytics. Now analytics takes lots of different forms. And much of what uh, I do is very simple descriptive analytics, summarising the data, reporting what has happened. Um, Trying to do that in an insightful way and in a way that is useful for, for, the, for the coaches, for the decision making. That can then lead on to, uh, and often what I've reported is on the basis of diagnostic work that I've done, modelling the past outcomes, uh, trying to understand what has happened, why it's happened, and often then that can give you an insight into what it is when you look at uh, situation, uh, situations in the future, what you should report and pull out of that. So close link between the diagnostic and descriptive. Predictive, forecast and simulation, what's going to happen next? Leading into the prescriptive, what should we do? It takes you into areas of optimization and scheduling and strategy. So lots of different strands to analytics. When it comes to teaching analytics, Yes, it goes without saying that data analysts have got to have these excellent, what I would call the hard skills, the mathematical, statistical, and computing skills. But they also need excellent soft skills. They've got to be great communicators. They've got to be able to work in teams. It's an art and a science. They've got, uh, analysts, effective analysts, have got to be able to frame the practical problem the decision maker faces, to frame that as an analytical problem, do the analysis and then translate the results back into practical recommendations. Uh, it's not enough to have just great mathematical, statistical and computing skills. And the challenge we face as teachers in analytics is how to ensure our students have got good soft skills as well. I'm a, a keen exponent of a uh, believer that the, the, within the teaching of analytics there's got to be a case-based approach that's holistic, that allows them to pull together skills with as much practical experience as possible. For me, and this has created issues, um, certainly within, uh, within academia, uh, for me, analytics is a vacation, not a discipline. And uh, I've had some interesting, interesting arguments as I've tried to develop a business analytics degree program uh, within the business school at Leeds. It's also, I think, incredibly important uh, that um, analysts have got humility. Too often, 
I've found analysts who've got what I would call the master of the universe mindset. They know it all. Their, uh, their ability to analyze the numbers gives them the sense that they are in control. They know it all. And that kind of mindset just switches off the decision maker because you're not giving them respect. Uh, and that's uh, an effective analyst has got, yes, they are incredibly bright people, but they've also got to be humble. And if they're not, they will not be able to develop the relationships they need with the decision makers to be effective. So it's quite, there are a number of demands that we face to put together, to teach analytics. But in some senses, as I said, it's, it's an old wine in a new bottle. They're all the issues, really, that all of you face day in and day out teaching OR. Uh, it's, we c call it analytics. I could just rub that word out, analytics, put in OR, and I think everything I've said there is because, in a sense, that it is analytics is a new word for something we've been doing for, for many, many years, doing analysis for purpose. So sports analytics, using data to try and get a competitive advantage in elite sport. Right, uh, in terms of sports analytics, for me, what I define it as is the, the use of analysis of tactical data to support coaching decisions. Sport, uh, analytics is used in professional sport, both in the business side of sport, as well as, if you like, in the sport and side of sport. I, the, the business, uh, I don't see what, what's being done in a professional sports franchise on the business side as very much different from what's being done in other businesses. Uh, so I see that as business analytics. For me, sports analytics is the use of data anal analysis to support coaching decisions. Uh, it's to influence those sporting decisions that can be improved by knowing the numbers and knowing the numbers better. So the sort of decisions in terms of identifying talent, uh, assessing the player development, planning training schedules. Um, and indeed, one of the things that's happened in the, in the last few months while working with London Irish is that I've developed a very close relationship with some of the sports scientists there in terms of analyzing some of the tactical data uh, to feed back into uh, workloads and, uh, and how uh, training sessions are being planned. Reviewing the performance of individual players and teams, developing tactical game plans, which can have an influence on team selection. Inputting into player recruitment and into where I started with, who started from valuing of players. All of those are decisions all of those are decisions that have to be made. Uh, what I would argue is that data analysis, sports analytics, can provide an evidential base to help inform all of those decisions. So the, the types of work that I'm analyzing in tactical analytics, the types of reports have been a lot of this summer. I'm working with a team that's just been promoted. They've had a year out of, the, uh, out of the premiership, out of the top division. So a lot of my work during the summer has been analyzing the, uh, the last year's play in the premiership, getting the coaches at London Irish back up to speed about uh, how game, uh, game play and how teams have developed. So that basic tactical principle. It's about reviewing games, opposition analysis. That's what I was doing yesterday. Uh, and on Sunday, I, I did uh, a brief review of, of our, our game on Saturday, uh, but analysing uh, what we could from the first couple of games, uh, analysing uh, uh, the sale for, to prepare for Friday night and developing player and team ratings. OK, break from me for a moment. Uh, Sports analytics in action, I'm going to argue that, you know, Moneyball is, uh, has been a, an important game changer. Uh, and as Stuart Main, I've been fortunate of to know the inside story. don't know Brad Pitt, but I do know the character he plays in the film. So uh, let's just have Brad Pitt instead of me for two minutes. Moneyball, um, the book was published by Michael, Michael Lewis in uh, 2003, uh, and it's based, uh, and I emphasize based, 
on a true story. It's, it's the story of uh, the Oakland Athletics, uh, a major league baseball team who uh, have got a relatively small budget to spend on player salaries. Uh, and they started to use statistical analysis uh, to, uh, you know, as you saw uh, in the trailer of the line, buy wins, not players. Uh, they tried to allocate their budget uh, for player, uh, pl uh, player salaries to allocate it on the basis of trying to get the most wins per dollar spent. Um, they used statistical analysis to try and identify which players to sign. Um, they developed what I would call a David strategy, that they didn't have the financial muscle, they weren't financial goliaths like the New York Yankees and the Boston Red Sox, so they had to develop an alternative way of doing it. They had to take, if you like, use brains rather than brawn. They had to use, uh, uh, develop a strategy. If they wanted to be competitive, they had to work out a way of trying to be competitive without, I come from Leeds, uh, without doing a Peter Ridsdale and spending money you don't have and going bankrupt. Uh, they were working within a tight financial regime uh, and how could they try and allocate the resources in a, a more effective way. And the, the book was written by Michael Lewis. It was turned into a film in 2010. Uh, if you're a, a West Wing fan, it was Aaron Sorkin who did the West Wing who, who managed to take uh, a book uh, uh, the book Moneyball and turn it into uh, a, a Hollywood script that uh, got uh, got some Oscar nominations. The book was written by Michael Lewis. Michael Lewis was his background's in finance. He worked in the uh, worked in the financial sector uh, and then moved. Uh, he actually was based in London for a time. Worked as a part-time writer for the Financial Times. His career plan was to write. He his initial books were on. Uh, fine, uh, on finance, and indeed he's come back to that writing on the financial crisis. Uh, but he, he, he started to move into taking his financial uh, outlook and writing on his love of sport. Both uh, he, he also wrote The Blind Side, um, which uh, uh, won, a, won an Oscar, was also turned into a movie. Uh, and if you read the first chapter of The Blind Side, you get a real insight into the labor mar players' labor market in the NFL. Um, what, why this appealed, uh, the story of the Oakland A's appealed to Michael Lewis was that it was, for those of you who got an, e uh, an economics background, he saw it as a, 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 a case of market inefficiency, of uh, the efficient market hypothesis that Basically, from Michael Lewis's viewpoint, what he saw Billy Bean is doing was what he himself had done. Both of them are kindred spirits. They're traders by nature. And they take advantage of people not using information efficiently. And that's what Oakland were doing. The analysis had been around for 20, 30 years was called sabermetrics, but it was seen to be what the geeks and the anoraks were interested in. No self-respecting member of the industry that is Major League Baseball would deal. Leave it to the people who are playing fantasy baseball. But what they had uncovered uh, using their analysis was, for example, the teams weren't valuing players properly. They weren't actually using the most predictive statistics when it came to, to rating players. So team, the people who were picking fantasy baseball teams were doing it better than the professionals. And Billy Bean uh, at Oakland tapped into that and, and with great success. The book focuses on those two years, 2001, 2002. The film focuses on 2002. It starts at the end of 2001. There are 30 teams in Major League Baseball in those two years, uh, the Oakland A's were either in 2001, the second lowest spenders spend. in salary, in 2002, the third lowest spenders. But they, of the 30 teams, they had the second best regular season records um, in both of those seasons. 
and they were spending about a third to a quarter of what the Yankees were spending. Indeed, the Yankees won one more game uh, than uh, Oakland, I think it was in 2002, and spent about $90 million more to win one game out of 162 games uh, schedule. Um, so, incredibly, and, you know, uh, despite a book being written about it, and then a film, Oakland, uh, from the time that Billy took over as general manager in 1998, he inherited a losing team, and up until 2015, every season was a winning season, yet they remained one of the lowest spenders. They've gone through a, a relatively poor phase on the pitch at the moment over the last two, three years. Uh, they've sold... Uh, sold a lot of the, the star players that they've developed and they, they've had losing seasons, but they'll come again. Uh, the, what they've had to do, however, is continually reinvent themselves, continually look for new sources of advantage as teams have caught up and recognised what they're doing. So every team now has a, has a department of analysts working for them. Uh, it was a real... Money, game changer, money ball, in the sense that, you know, we know in any walk of life, there's nothing like success or winning to, to persuade. So it's been a, a success story, and you've got this analytics hero, Billy Bean, that can encapsulate uh, the, the success of using numbers, and, and, and we've got, uh, you know, Brad Pitt as well on site to, to represent. So between the book and the film, it's, it's had an, an amazing impact around the world on elite sport uh, because of, it is the success story, a team that was actually using data analysis and being successful because they'd found ways to exploit mistaken conventional wi uh, wisdom. In particular, uh, the two that were key um, fallacies that they exploited was, first of all, um, Major League, Major League Baseball teams tended to mainly, uh, mainly rec draft players coming out of high school at 18. And the players who didn't get drafted at 18 and went off to college in some senses were seen as failures. So when they came back into the draft towards the end of the college career, they tended to be much cheaper to acquire than the high school players. But of course, they're now three years older in terms of both their physiology and their psychology, and they've been playing a high level of ball game while they've been in college. So Billy started to change Oakland's drafting strategy to get more college players. There was a, basically a subjective discount being uh, had. And then secondly, hitters, that uh, they were, uh, Billy started to use a stat called on-base percentage. Conventionally, uh, players were measured in terms of their ability to hit the ball and get to base. But that's not only the only way that you get to base. You can be walked to base. But that, was, that was, wasn't being built in by teams. It was almost what, uh, what the commons call a free lunch. Billy bought these free lunches for now. That he started to look at players who had an above average propensity to be what? Because in the past, it basically been seen that this was a pitcher error if a player was walked. But it's also a, a hitter's skill to decide which pitches to go after, which to leave alone. And that wasn't, there wasn't a value, a salary value being put on that. And on-base percentage, statistically, is a far better predictor of winning than the conventional batting and slugging averages. Uh, the long-term significance... As I said, there's nothing like a real case, a case study of success uh, to, to, to make an argument. And uh, here was a case study of analytics actually influencing sporting decisions and a case study that made it onto the best-selling charts in, the, in terms of the book sales and then made it all the way to Hollywood. So incredibly, uh, an incredible dispersion of the, of the knowledge of this case study. But the other thing, and people forget the, t the subtitle of this book, Moneyball, and they all think, hey, it's about science, it's about using numbers. But they forget the subtitle of the book, The Art of Winning an Unfair Game. Bill, uh, I'm fortunate that I ended up being introduced to Billy. Oakland A's own a, a, a soccer team in Major League Soccer, and I've worked with 
uh, work with uh, the A's, with the ownership group, to see how they could take what they did in baseball and extend it to soccer. And indeed, my involvement from RZ Alkmaar as a baseball connection, the guy, Robert Einhorn, who's the general manager of RZ Alkmaar in Holland, uh, went to college in the States and was drafted by the, drafted by the Yankees. Never quite made it. Had about 40-odd appearances in the MLB. Came back and, oh, I guess it's Loughborough, so I can... Did, it became a kind of Sir Clive Woodward figure in Dutch baseball, got knighted, uh, and then was asked to come and uh, run AZ Alkmaar. And uh, he, uh, he used his baseball connections, got Billy involved as an advisor to the board, and one of the pieces of advice, fortunately, that Billy gave uh, Robert was get Bill involved. So I, I now work with, uh, I've been working for the last three, four years advising and helping RZ develop their, their analytic system. What I know of Billy is he uses all the available evidence. He watches players, he watches the video, he, he goes to games and he takes all the stats. He uses all the available evidence. It's art and science. And people often forget that. So here are some of the involvements. I guess the last team that coaches I, that I got involved with who took my work seriously were Bolton Wanderers when Big Sam uh, was the manager. I did my coaching badges there. I've got the UEFA B license. Uh, and I, uh, they took some interest. And uh, that work that I did with Bolton and a number of those people that I work with now hold fairly. Uh, senior positions in clubs such as Manchester City and Liverpool and others. But there wasn't really that much interest beyond that initial work in the uh, around about 2005, 2006. British football hasn't been that interested in what I've done. As I said, Billy got involved with Billy Bean, working with the San Jose Earthquakes that are owned by the Oakland A's. And then uh, Sky Sports, uh, um, brought me in to work on the Rugby League. Any Rugby League fans? No Rugby League fans, not unusual. Uh, I, I developed, uh, I provided the stats for both their previews, their, uh, their review programs during, and then during the game, they, I developed a performance gauge that had key performance indicators and would predict what the, based on the KPIs, what the margin should be at any point in time, and it was uncanny how often they'd flash up the performance gauge, and it would say that one team based on its KPIs should be further ahead, and they'd score. It was, uh, it was uncanny for the three seasons that I worked with that, and we developed a traffic light system, so this little box would come up uh, down in the, in the corner of the screen. Uh, worked with British Cycling, worked with the Sharks in in South Africa, my current involvement is London Irish and RZ. But I guess my major involvement in really in terms of developing this evidence-based coaching and getting analytics into the coal face of working with the coaches in the coaching room was at Saracens. Um, the Saracens, uh, a point, Saracens have been a team that have been around for 100 years and won one trophy, one cup, knockout cup in the whole of 100 odd years. And from the, the uh, professional era started in the mid 90s, they spent an inordinate amount of money bringing in some really high class veteran Southern Hemisphere players who every so often would put a great game together. But they weren't particularly consistent. Um, <coughs> A uh, South African consortium came in to join Nigel Ray uh, in 2009, and they appointed a new director of rugby, uh, Brendan Ventner. Brendan, uh, South African, he's a qualified GP. He's got his own medical practice in the Strand, just outside Cape Town. Uh, for those of you who know your, South, uh, uh, your rugby history, or let's keep the movie theme going, how many have seen Invictus? Right, you remember that scene where Mandela is learning the players' names and he helicopters into the training ground? If you go back and watch that scene when he gets off the, the helicopter, goes over, this is the day before the World Cup final, and, and Victor, for those who do, tells the story of how Mandela used rugby union, the white man's game, to bring the country together. And, and I don't think it's overestimated that rugby played a role of 
uh, played a, a massive role, I think, in the way that Mandela used it to, to overcome uh, the, the, the conflict in, uh, within South Africa when he, uh, as president, uh, and he took a lot of, he, he got a lot of criticism from many of his supporters for his, uh, his use of rugby. But on that scene, he gets off the helicopter. He's been learning all the names. If you listen closely, the first name he says is, Hi, Brendan. Brendan was a young international on the, on the square. He came on as a replacement in the final against the All Blacks. Uh, came, he played for London Irish in 1997 to 99. He then uh, came back and was player coach for a couple of years, uh, 2002 to, to, uh, 2001, 2002. Uh, but he's got a medical practice. But he, w he agreed to come in as a director of rugby at Saracens in 2009. And he undertook a major change process. This was a team, an organisation that had been incredibly unsuccessful, uh, despite the resource they'd had available. Uh, he had a night of the long knives. He basically... Uh, told the board not to renew the contracts of 18 players. Eddie Jones, at the, was, was, uh, uh, Brendan was, uh, wasn't actually in post at that point, he was consultant, and Eddie Jones, the England coach, was actually director of rugby and immediately resigned, uh, saying his, you know, how could he continue to the end of the season when 18 players had just been told they're out of work at the end of the season. So uh, he started, a, uh, he, he also, in terms of the support staff, coaching staff, and, uh, massive restructuring. He created a culture that is still there to this day and is the, is the reason why Saracens have been so successful and evidence-based, people-centered. Brendan told me very early on that as a doctor... He treats people, not diseases, and he makes the decisions that he does with the best available evidence that he has. And that's the approach that he adopted at Saracens and created a culture that put analytics and personal development. So core, you know, he brought in a couple of people. He brought in a sports psychologist. Six months down the line, he brought me in. Uh, I worked with Saracens from March 2010 through to the end of the 2015 season during which time, having won one trophy in 100 years, they competed in 14 major semi-finals and finals and won the Aviva Premiership twice. Uh, I've linked up with Brendan again. Those of you who follow Rugby Union probably know that Brendan picks up coaching gigs like some of us have hot dinners. Uh, he is still a doctor, has a practice. In fact, I've just spent a couple of weeks in Cape Town. My daughter shadowed him in his medical uh, in his medical practice. Uh, he advises South Africa. He's been instrumental to the turnaround in the South African national team this year. Uh, he advises his good friend Conor O'Shea with the Italian team. And he was brought in as technical director at the club where he played in England, London Irish. And now I'm back working with Brendan. I've helped him with South Africa uh, and Italy a bit. In fact, I did a report for Brendan last autumn on when Italy played South Africa, what are the strengths and weaknesses of South Africa? And Italy won. And then Brendan got a double value from that. He's now working with South Africa and Putin to, can use my report to put together, you know, what are the weaknesses we need to, to sort out. Again, London Irish, uh, every, we're everyone's favorite to go down because most teams that come up go straight back down again. It's such a big divide but we're gonna give it a, a damn good shot to stay up. And again, Brendan is creating a culture rooted in medical practice, evidence-based, people-centered. Okay, uh, just to, to finish, where are we, Stuart? Yeah, uh, just to give you a sense of where we're at cutting the edge and then a couple of take, uh, some takeaways and then uh, hopefully throw it open for questions. Um, Space is absolutely at core of, uh, w uh, of in the invasion territorial sports. Those sports that one way or another are emulating the battlefield and trying to move uh, an object into enemy defended territory. So the essence of those sports are the control of space through the tactical coordination of players. So being able to analyze the spatial dimension is absolutely crucial. And that's where most of my work is. And I think we're at, there are three different levels. 
a lot of teams are working at this level one, zone frequency data. I think certainly uh, this is where the leading edge is now, but uh, trajectory data level three. And I'll just quickly give you a sense of what those three levels are. The zone data, what I mean by that is, you know, most of the data we get, the summary data, is, is tally counts of actions. Zone frequency data is where you're getting those frequency counts, but zoned by the areas of the pitch. So the simplest way is to use pitch mark, and so in football, to, to use the halfway line in penalty areas, in rugby union, to separate the pitch up by the halfway line and the 22 meter lines. If you've got X, Y coordinates of where things are happening, then you can create uh, zones such as you'll often find that teams, uh, football teams report date in terms of the defensive third, the middle third of the pitch, and the final third of the pitch. That's widely used. And what this allows you is to start to put together heat and intensity maps and metrics that are specific to particular zones. And because I work across a number of these invasion sports, there's a lot of bait similarities in the tactics. Basically, you want to get the ball out of your half and play as little with the ball in your half and do most of your play in the opposition half. The more you play in your own half, the more likely you are to lose possession and then it's a lot more difficult to defend because they're closer to your try line, your goal, and it's a lot more, there's a, a, you don't have the time to get back into defensive shape. So when it comes to looking at, there are metrics that you're looking at in your own half are much more of what I would call exit met. How good are you at getting out of your own half as opposed to attacking metrics once you're in the opposition half? Here's an example. The last game I worked for Saracens was the Premiership final. They beat Bath, who had been the best attacking team that season. They beat them, beat them in the first half, 25-3. Why? Because Bath played too much rugby in their own half. Here's the, what I mean by this zone frequency data. This is the number of breakdowns that the teams won in the different areas of pitch. Bath won 37 breakdowns in their own, uh, between their own 22 and a half way line and their own half. That is coloured red because it means that they're playing far too much rugby. And sure enough, that's why they lost. They lost possession in those uh, nine times in that area of the pitch because they were playing too much rugby. Saracens were able to defend in the opposition half, 25-3 halftime, game over. Yeah, Bath tried to come back, but the, uh, the uh, Saracens, you know, that's the danger of playing too much in your own half. And... Uh, Bath effectively, you know, handed, handed the game to, to Saracens by poor tactical decisions in their game plan. Okay, now, a lot of teams are doing that kind of analysis. Where we're moving to now is level two, and this is, a, this is the sort of XML files that I'm, that I'm working with now. This is just an XML, but I'm getting these columns of data, XY coordinates, this is where the event has occurred, and if it's an event that's involved the ball moving, then you get the XY coordinates of where the ball's been moved to. So I'm getting data, uh, XY coordinate data uh, on uh, uh, rugby and football. This is the type of data that I'm, main, I'm mainly working with, with now and where I've kind of developed a competitive advantage on that. Here's uh, one application. This is uh, work I did for AZ. What you've got is you know where every player has touched the ball, the XY coordinates. So you can put, when you see these maps that are over, they're giving you the average position of the players, where they've touched the ball. And just pull this out. This is for 15 minute segments in a game that AZ played against Ajax a couple of seasons ago. And the, the left wing back, a guy called Veltman, that's his average position the first 15 minutes from the second 15, 15 to 30. And from, so the, that's his average position in the first half. First 15 minutes of the second half. He pushed for, he was playing for the four, he was, uh, most of his touches where the ball were level with our main striker. We were far too slow in picking that up. The game was lost in those 15 minutes. We were far too slow to pick up that, that during halftime break, 
they pushed Veltman on and told him to move on and play. And he create, by the, t the damage was done by the time we picked that up. Post-match review showed, showed why we lost that game. We lost it in those 15 minutes there. That's what I call zone two. It's starting to use the X, Y coordinates. Those of you who watch Match of the Day, they've started to use something called expected goals. That's based on using X, Y coordinates of every shot at goal and working out the probabilities of success. Where we are going is what I call trajectory data, which is the continuous locational data of all players and the ball, not just when the ball... Uh, uh, when players are on the ball, which is what the level two data, but having that data continuously of where the player is at every moment in time. The data that's provided by video tracking systems are GPS wearables. You'll see them, uh, rugby players have them in a pouch on the back of their necks, J JPS. Now at the moment, they're mainly being used by sports scientists uh, to analyze physical performance but there's enormous potential for tactical applications. And one of the sports that's ahead of the game on this, excuse the pun, is, ba uh, is basketball. Partly because it's a smaller space, smaller court, and a smaller number of players. But they've been very advanced in analyzing space. They've developed uh, uh, a measure called CHAD, which provides a measure, and I'll just go down, of defensive stretch. So this is the, the defenders, uh, the defenders are, and uh, this is Chad, this, this area here. What this allows you to do is start to put a measure on the influence that at uh, an attacker can have in stretching that defensive space, because the more you stretch it, the more easier it is then to get through and get a basket. So you might have play players on your team who are called who we would call floor spacers, that one of the primary functions is not so much what they score, but the space they create. And we can now put a measure on that. How does Chad change that defensive area? How does that change depending on which attackers uh, are on the, on the court? So that gives you a sense of, I think, you know, the depth that analytics is now getting to. So takeaways, analytics, purpose-led analysis. It's about talk, and then further talk and recommendation, the analysis sandwich in the middle. Talk, analyze, recommend. It's an art and a science. It's a potential David strategy for, to compete against resource-rich arrivals, or in my case, at London Irish, against much more experienced rivals. Spatial economics, it's at the leading edge. Uh, and, and that's where a lot of effort is going in. And not just in the invasion sports, um, in all sports, for example, in baseball, that data, I was talking recently with a, an astrophysicist who's just moved into working with a consultancy firm uh, to, uh, to analyze the spatial data that's now available, trajectory data available in baseball. And importantly, what I've found, that the teams where evidence-based coaching has been most successful are teams where you've got buy-in from the leadership and the there is a culture that embraces evidence-based uh, approaches to decision-making. Thank you.